Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 7. And that's what I want to speak on this morning, Jesus living inside of us. I'm so glad that my son and daughter-in-law and my grandson Lucas is here. He looked right up. You know, what do you do with a four-year-old boy who has all kinds of energy? Well, someone recommended this week that knew Lucas was coming and that he loves dinosaurs. And so they, they, taught, they told us about a, a museum, the name of it. The Museum of Natural History. How many have heard of that museum? Okay, how many haven't heard of that? Okay, well, I've only been here three years. So, so we went down there, and, and you walk in, and, and the first thing you see in the lobby are these big dinosaurs. I mean, they were great, and then we walked through, and we went through some uh, other places, and, you know, they're bones. It's not the real thing. And then we went into some exhibits where they had elephants, but they looked real, but they weren't. We went to another floor, and they had dinosaurs, and Lucas, bring me up your dinosaur. You going to come up? Come on. Come on. You want to come up? You want me to come down? Okay, I'll come down. Hey, what kind of dinosaur is this? You don't know. You knew every kind. We went through all the exhibits, and all the animals are dead. They're lifeless. They're not real. There's something different between a museum and a zoo. You know, he would run by the animals because there was no noises, there was no movement, there was no action. It was just dead. Even though they looked real, they were dead. You know where I'm going with this? There are a lot of people in churches that are just like the museum. They're as dead as this dinosaur. There's no life in them. When you go to a zoo, the animals move. They, 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 they gather interest. There's smells. When people are dead, there's no smells. In a zoo, there's messes. In a museum, there's no messes. And if we're going to have the life of God in us, we got to go from this to being alive in the power of Jesus Christ because Jesus' presence is in our lives. And if we've come just to church to be in a museum, then, friends, we are lifeless and deadless. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more and abundantly. And he wants us to walk like a zoo and not like a museum. In John chapter 7, I want to talk about that. We've been looking at the real Jesus. And, and Jesus is not uh, good for saints that are in a museum. But Jesus wants us to have him living on the inside of us. And when Jesus is on the inside of us, how can we be lifeless? How can we be joyless? How can we be empty of his presence when he wants to give us life like we've never had before? It says in John chapter Chapter 7, verse 37, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. As the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believe in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. I thank God for the power of his word. I thank God that Jesus came who was born as a babe. I thank God that he lived on this earth for 33 and a third years. I'm so thankful that he went to the cross and he died for my sins and that he was buried and he rose again on the third day and he said I'm going back to my father but one day I'm coming to call you home and I'm thankful for that but Jesus says that when if I go away it's for your good because I will send you the comforter. I'll send you the counselor. I'll send you the advocate 
it. I will send you the power of my presence to live and to dwell in your life. It's for your advantage, Jesus said, that I go away. I like the way it says it in the King James, because I will send the comforter. You know, we love comfort. We don't like being changed. We like being that that dead dinosaur. You know, nothing can move me. Nothing changes me. We just are comfortable. We love comfort food. Whatever your comfort food is, rice and beans or pizza, Twinkies or brownies. We love comfort clothes. We love, you know, spandex because it expands with us. We like those waists that, you know, they they keep on stretching no matter what. You know, we love wearing sweats because it doesn't constrain us. Uh, We love comfortable shoes. We we love comfort things that bring us comfort. Uh, We love comfortable chairs. And that's what we want in life. And, And we live in a world that is so hurting and so messed up and so so dysfunctional, and and Jesus knew that we would need something outside of ourselves, that we don't need more rules and regulations, but we needed something on the inside of us, because when we get knocked down, his presence will pick us up. When we go through difficult times, his word will be there to comfort us, and Jesus came to help us and to comfort us and, and minister to us in the most difficult times of life. Remember, as a married couple, if those who are parents, and you know, you were having that first child, and you know, your wife comes home and gives you the good news that I'm expecting a child, and now they say you got to go for Lamaze classes. And men have no idea what a Lamaze class even is. But you go into a Lamaze class, and they teach you how to breathe. You know, and as a man, I, you know, when Emma told me we'd have to go for those classes many, many, many years ago, uh, hopefully I haven't changed too much, but, but you know, they're going to teach you how to breathe. I said, I know how to breathe. I breathe every day, 24-7. I know how to breathe. And then you get in the class, and they show you everything, and they tell you, now you gotta, you got to breathe this way, and, you know, there's deep breathing in and out. And then there's panting. <laughs> And then there's slow breathing. Then there's those cleansing breaths. Why do they teach you how to breathe? Because they say that breathing helps you to focus the mind. And and as you focus the mind, it actually causes you less stress and, and nerves and pain. And I'm so thankful that there is a spiritual significance to that. That the Holy Spirit is described as the breath of God. And that we need the breath of God. There's an old song we used to sing, let it breathe, let it breathe on me. Let the breath of God now breathe on me. We need the breath of God. Can I have an amen? Without the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can't breathe. And without life, you don't breathe. And without breath, you're not going to live. And God wants his people. He wants his church not to be a museum of dead saints that have no life life in them, but that he says, I want to breathe in you the very presence of God so that you can go through the deepest valley and you can climb over the highest mountain. Why? Because you have the breath of God living in you. It says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, and the Lord God formed man on the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils and he became a living soul. Aren't you glad that God breathed life into Adam and he he breathes life into us. The moment we ask Jesus into our life, we became a new creation and the breath of God has come into our life. And after the resurrection, Jesus was with his disciples and said in John 20, 22, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. In the book of Ezekiel, we read that God breathed into the valley of dry bones. And I wanted to try that yesterday when I saw those dinosaur bones. I wanted to breathe on them and see if they came back to life. But friends, let me tell you, God said, I breathed into the valley of dry bones. And when God breathes life, it will bring the driest person back to life. It will bring the deadest person back to life. It will bring Staten Island back to life because when the God's breath breathes on us, it changes us from the inside out. In John chapter 7, Jesus told his disciples that he was going to die. 
And they were overwhelmed by sorrow. They were overwhelmed. They were shocked. They were despondent. And in John 6, Jesus was talking about what was going to happen. And the people began to leave Jesus because he started talking about the sacrifice and the cost. And there are many Christians who only want to follow Jesus as long as there's no cost. And Jesus turned to his 12 disciples and said, all these people are leaving me. Do you want to leave me as well? And the disciples and the people were close to Jesus and, and they were asking what's going to go on. And you turn to John chapter 7 and Jesus began to answer the questions of, of what's going to happen. And in John 7 verse 37 we see the Feast of Tabernacles and, and that's where this uh, tabernacle is going on. And it was designed to commemorate the 40 year journey in the wilderness and, and the Israelites would make little tents and, and they would stay in those tents during the festival uh, to symbolize that what the Lord provided for them in the wilderness. Aren't you glad that God provides for us in the wilderness? He doesn't just provide when things are comfortable. When for 40 years the children of God, their clothes never wore out, their sandals never wore out, and God provided everything they need. And friends, when we go through the wilderness times of life, His presence will be there. He will provide for us. He will supply. Why? Because He'll never leave us and He'll never forsake us. And then there was an event in the Feast of Tabernacles called the Great Outpouring. And in that outpouring, the, the, the priests would gather these large ball, bowls of water. And on the thing, they would begin to pour them out over the steps of the temple. And the water would flow down and, and the water would touch people. And, and when the water flowed and touched people, there was an exuberant of joy and of praise in the house of God. And Jesus was saying that, that wherever my presence goes, there's going to be joy. There's going to be worship. There's going to be praise. And that's what he says in verse 37 and 38. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Is anyone thirsty? Dead people aren't thirsty. We went out to Danino's last night for pizza. Amen. And Lucas took his little dinosaur, the one I just had, and he put it, his, the head into his drink. <laughs> Dead things don't drink. Dead things don't want to drink. But when you are alive, you need to drink. When you're alive in God's presence, you want to drink at the water that shall never run dry. And if I can go week on week without drying, get, die, uh, without drinking, I'm going to be a spiritual death. But God wants us to drink from the river. He wants us to have an overflow in our life that will not be satisfied. But he says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And that was the purpose of Jesus saying I, I used to be on the outside walking with you as you saw in the movie but friends when I go back to my father I'm going to send the Holy Spirit I'm going to send the presence of Jesus and that presence is going to live within you and he gives us 10 promises that I got to answer in 15 minutes turn me to John chapter 14 15 and 16 and I'm not going to take time to read it, but over a cup of coffee, Diet Coke, whatever, water, whatever you want to drink, read these three chapters this week. But I want to give you ten promises of how we can grow more intimate and have Jesus on the inside of us. Let me give you some promises. Promise number one, Jesus is gone back to heaven to make heaven ready for us. See, when Jesus is on the inside, I'm just a pilgrim passing through. This world is not my home. I'm going to spend an eternity with him. Jesus says in John 14, 1 and 2, do not let your hearts be 
troubled. Man, you know, there are too many Christians who are overwhelmed with things of life and they get troubled and they're upset and they're agitated and they're frustrated. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. If you're troubled this morning, let me tell you, Jesus wants to make you alive in the power of his presence. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's man house has many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Tom, your sister, is in a mansion today. Those that have lost loved ones, they're already on the other side, and they're better than they've ever been down here. And friends, one day, we're moving as well. We're just changing addresses, but we're as live then as we are today. And I can be encouraged today that I'm not dead. I'm not a museum saint, but I'm a child of the living God who is preparing a place for me on the other side and I can walk with joy and hope today because he is preparing a place for me. He's up there getting the mansion ready. Oh, I hope my mansion has Red Sox stuff. But not only is he in heaven making heaven ready for me, but he sent the Holy Spirit to make me ready for heaven. Oh, we want him to do all the work up there. He says, no, look at John 14, verse 16. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He says, yeah, I'm going back to heaven to prepare a place for you. But I'm sending the Holy Spirit to live in you, to make you ready to come to heaven. And friends, some of us aren't there yet because we're not ready yet. How about Enoch? He walked with God. He was so close to God that he just walked. And he was translated right into heaven. See, God wants us to be ready for heaven. I don't have time to read all of Colossians chapter 3. But the Holy Spirit is preparing us. God's preparing us to be a place in heaven for eternity. What a promise, what a promise. He says, I'm preparing a place for you, but you need my presence to get ready to spend an eternity with the Father. Promise number two, God wants to use us to do greater things than he did. Greater things, that was the theme for 2014 that God gave me uh, back last fall. John 14, 12, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. That dead dinosaur can't do anything. Those elephants at the museum, they just stood there morning, noon, and night. You can touch them. You can tickle them. You can give them a peanut. It doesn't matter. They're dead. Nothing's going to move them. But friends, when someone is alive, let me tell you, there is action. There is movement. And God says, you will do greater things than I did. It says in John, and through the Gospels, that he healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He ministered to those demon possessed. He forgave people of their sins. Is. He raised people from the dead. He touched people. And Jesus says, you will do greater things than these when I go back to the Father. Jesus says, I'm only one person. But when I send the Holy Spirit and Jesus is living in you, you will be the same as I was. And you can do greater things than I did because I gave you the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells within you. I don't need a teller evangelist to do it. I don't need a preacher to do it. I don't need a, but he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and you'll be doing greater things. I love what Matthew 28 says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you. 
to the very end of the age. He's with me. Everyone should be doing greater works. It says the multiply influence of the Holy Spirit. But when we are lifeless, there's nothing coming out of us. There's no action. There's no movement. Are you doing the works of Jesus? Are, are we making a difference in our own life? That is why we need the power of Jesus living in us. Greater things takes a greater amount of the Holy Spirit. I must decrease so that he may increase in my life. Promise number three. Jesus will answer prayers when they are in the will of God. Look at verses 13 and 14 of John 14. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. See, lifeless people don't know how to pray. Lifeless people don't see the need of prayer. But when Jesus is on the inside, you realize that prayer is, is the lifeblood of the child of God. And, and that prayer changes things. Not manipulation, not people, not things. But prayer still changes things. How many know God's going to answer prayer and we may not always like it? Sometimes God's going to say no. Just like a good parent will say no at times to his children. And God says no to us because I have something better for you. I, I have something better. It's not for your best. It's not for your good. And God will sometimes say no. Sometimes God's going to say wait. And, and we don't like the wait. We want to be comfortable. We want God to do it now. And, and we want the answer. Uh, but we need to be persistent. We need to be tenacious. That God, I don't see the answer. But I'm going to pray until the answer comes, Lord. I'm going to wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And I'm going to wait on you, God. And, and I'm not going to give up on you and I'm going to press through and, and God your presence is with me even in the waiting times because he's developing something in us and sometimes God will say yes. How many like the yeses? And we know that in all things, all things, in all things God works together for good to those who love God and called according to his purpose. See, things that are dead don't have any understanding of what God wants to do. But when you are alive in the presence of God, it doesn't matter what comes against us. It doesn't matter what's going on around us because I know that on the inside there is something that is alive in me and Jesus is alive. And if you've allowed the life of God to come out of you, it says over in Luke chapter 10, uh, Luke chapter 11, uh, turn with me there, Luke chapter 11 verse 5. Listen to what it says there about prayer and why lifeless people can't pray. But those that have the life of God can pray because of what his word says. It says, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come. Uh, to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because, I love these words, of your shameless audacity. See, when you have a friend, you don't give up. A friend, you're going to hold on. He says, because of their shameless audacity, they continue to knock. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, verse 9, ask, 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 and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. And here's the results for everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. 
Ask. When I ask, it will be given. When I seek, I will find what I'm seeking for. When I knock, it will be open to me. Someone said it this way, if I won't, he won't. If I won't pray, he's not going to answer prayers that aren't asked. If I won't praise, it says put on the garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. Well, I don't feel like I feel like a dead museum animal. It doesn't matter what you feel like on the outside. You begin to lift up the name that's above every other name. You begin to call out to him. And guess what? All of a sudden, something begins to stir on the inside. And we're waiting for external things to happen. You begin to do it on the inside. And the Holy Spirit will begin to change the situation situation on the outside it comes from the inside out not waiting for circumstances to change me waiting for me to say God I'm going to obey you I'm going to pray what a promise what a hope oh promise number four Jesus will bless me not for my words and my songs not for my emotions but for my obedience to him. Oh, there's a lot of Christians that know the right words to sing. They know how to come to church and go through the motions and the gestures and the phrases. And just like those animals at the museum yesterday, they, they, looked, they looked so real. They looked so good. They, I mean, they had the hair. They had, they had the eyes. They had the tusks. They, they looked so real, but there was nothing on the inside. John 14, verse 15 says there, If you love me, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Verse 23, Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and he will come to him and make a home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching." These words that you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. We obey the Lord because of love, because of the Spirit. Those things that used to be duty and discipline are now a delight. Things I used to go through the motions, now I, I, it's no longer I have to pray. Now I have a desire and a privilege to pray. It's no longer I have to go to church, but now I can't wait to get to church. Oh, it used to be I can't wait to stay away from sin. Now I don't want to sin. I want to be so far away from sin. I, I, I serve him now because of love. I don't serve him out of duty. Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to live within me, to make me and empower me to live a life that brings honor and glory to him. And if you are dead, if you're lifeless like those animals in the museum, then it doesn't matter what you do. But when you're alive, you have the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that lives and dwells within us. And now we want to bring honor and glory to him. Quickly, number five, promise five, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to live in us and help us in life. See, sometimes in life we get lost, as that song says. Without him I am lost. Says in John 14, 16, and I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another counselor to be with you forever. Friends, Jesus is saying, I'm no longer going to be with you. I'm no longer just going to walk with the disciples. I'm just not going to touch people. But now I'm going to live on the inside of you. Friends, when you get saved, you are born again. That means you have Jesus living on the inside of you. That if Jesus is living on you, he's not going to jump out. If you have unsaved children, unsaved grandchildren, let me tell you, God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. They, I may just desert him. I may want nothing to do with him, but let me tell you, God says, I will never leave you. He's going to be there. He's going to be there to get them. He's going to be there to pick them up when they fall. You think about it. The Holy Spirit will be in us continually. He will not forsake me. He will not abandon me. He will not reject me. My mother and father may reject me, but God will never reject me. That's the presence of Jesus on the inside. Promise number six, the Holy Spirit will show and lead us into all truth. If I'm a Christian, if, I, if I'm dead like those animals, I don't know truth from error. But let me tell you, when you have Jesus on the inside, you're not walking around in confusion. 
Oh, I better go get somebody else to give me a word of prophecy over my life. Oh, I better go find something to answer over here. Let me tell you, when Jesus is on the inside, you have the truth care, the truth giver living in you. You have him telling you. It says in John 14, 30, the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you in John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you. He will lead you. He will lead you into all truth. See, God's word clearly tells us our greatest enemy is not Satan. We got too many Christians afraid of the enemy. The Bible says you resist the devil and the devil will flee from you. Oh, some say the greatest enemy we have is the world. Yeah, we live in a wicked, sinful world. There's ungodly people. They can say, they're the great. oh, we can say the flesh. No, the reality is, God's word says the greatest enemy we have is our own heart. It says in Jeremiah, the heart is wickedly deceitful above all things. And when Jesus is in the heart, guess what? When the heart is alive, when the heart is pumping with, with spiritual things in Jesus, the world no longer seems so alluring. Because when Jesus is on the inside, when I look at the things of the world, it no longer grabs me. He no longer says, I'm going to have you. You can, the world tries to say, oh, look, and our heart, but where is our heart? If our heart is for the world, we're going to go that way. But if our heart is for the things of Jesus, we're going to go for that thing. We're going to draw. We're going to get him. Friends, let me tell you, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand? We need the truth of Jesus living in us, the truth of his word, the truth of his will. And Jesus promised to lead us into all truth. I don't need a fortune cookie or a Ouija board. To tell me the truth. He's already given me his truth. Amen. Promise number seven. The Holy Spirit will teach us and remind us all the promises of Jesus. And the, prom the problems are going to come into this world. It says in John 14, 26. But the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things. And will remind you of everything I have said to you. Friends, how many times we need reminders for everything. We have reminders on our iPhones. We have reminders on our iPads. We have sticky tabs. We have uh, business cards from doctors. This is when your next appointment is. And they still have to call us the day before the appointment. For what reason? To remind us of an appointment that we've already made. And friends, the reality is, is we, re we don't remember the promises of God. We don't remember when we're going through the trials of life. And God says, I'm going to send you the teacher who will live in you. And he will remind you of the promises that when I go through the valley of the shadow of death I'll fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff they comfort me I can remember the promises of God and when I'm anxious and I'm tight be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication present your request to God and the God of peace will be with you when I'm going through a financial crisis I know that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory and the only way that will come to pass is because the breath of God is in me and that Jesus is on the inside and he reminds me of the promises of God. See, God's word is different than any other book. The word of God without the Holy Spirit is a lifeless book. But when God takes his word and the Holy Spirit is on the inside, this becomes a powerful weapon in the hands of a believer. For it says in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And when I don't know which way to go, I can go to his word. And he speaks to me out of his word. Promise number eight, the Holy Spirit convicts people of sin. Man, we're pretty good trying to fix somebody else. See, the role of the Holy Spirit in John 16 is to convict. Conviction is different than guilt. 
My job is not to convict anyone. You can't convict a dead animal. Get right with God, you dumb thing. Get right. You can scream. You can kick a dead thing. It's no reaction. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws them. The presence of Jesus begins to stir. Just like in Adam. He was dead. When something's dead, you got to get down and you got to do CPR. You got to get down and you got to get your mouth to their mouth. And that's what God did when he came to Adam. He breathed life into him. Your unsaved mates, you know what they need? They don't need you to kick them. They need the breath of God. They need God to resuscitate them. No man comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws. See, the Holy Spirit, promise nine, will empower us to witness. To witness. Dead things don't witness. Dead things don't have a story to tell. But those who are alive by the presence of God. Maricel told me a testimony the other night about what happened at the movie. Just at the movie on Sunday night. She went there. She wasn't feeling good. She was battling some physical issues. She really didn't feel like going, but she went to the movie. She sat there. Just a movie. Just a movie. No power in a movie. As she watched the screen and Jesus began to heal. She said, why can't that be me today? And during, in a theater, in a theater. See, God doesn't just work at 1501 Richmond Ave. His presence can move in a public school. move in a workplace. You can move in a movie theater. She almost got up and left during the middle of the movie, but she stayed to the end. And God healed her. And the doctors have confirmed it. Why? Because the presence of Jesus. Stand all over this place. One last problem. Promise. The Holy Spirit will give real joy that nothing will be able to take it away. Look what it says in John 16, verse 21. Just listen to God's word. A woman giving birth to a child has pain. How many know there's pain in life? As we stand all over this place, you can stand with me. Because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything. In my name, ask, and you will receive. You will receive, and your joy will be complete. When a couple is getting ready, to give birth. I picked on Tim in the first service, so I might as well pick on him again. His wife and him are expecting their first baby in May. 
A lot of preparations being done. Put the crib together yet? 14,000 screws. Make sure everyone is accounted for. A lot of preparations for when that baby comes. A lot of worries and fears. Can I do it? Am I going to be a good dad, a good mom? What's going to take place? There's all kinds of things that begin to change. But you haven't seen anything yet. See, right now it's like the museum. Quiet. No messes. Pampers 101. But it may when that baby comes, everything changes. You were going to hold your son. How in the world can I love him? Because it was something that you created. That's what God wants to do. He wants to create life in and through him. I don't know where you are this morning, but I want you to know Jesus wants to do life in you. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Simple message. All over this place, are you like a museum animal? Or are you alive? Have you lost your peace, your joy, your purpose? Just like Ezekiel prophesied into the valley of dry bones. Lord, will you breathe all over this again? I'm so glad God never gets tired of doing CPR. He never gets tired of breathing. As we sing this song one more time, just a simple thing. If you're in this room and you need the presence of Jesus, if you need his life-giving power, you need Jesus to walk through life with you. And Lord, I'm desperate for you. I'm lost without you. You've lost your life, if you lost your joy, you've lost your song, you've lost your hope. You're in this room and you've never made Jesus your Lord and Savior.